Hey friend, thanks for popping in. Uh, I've got a special guest with me uh, today. Again, uh, if you if you haven't watched the last few episodes, you can go back and and grab them. But uh, had a uh, opportunity to have a few interviews with Paul Keith Davis. Paul Keith, thanks for mm-hmm, coming sorry. back. Absolutely to Oil Patch Pulpit. Um, uh, for those of you who maybe you're, this is your first uh, episode you caught with uh, Paul Keith and I. Uh, Paul Keith is someone, uh, he's been a minister, uh, I don't know, how many years have you been a minister? Well, I'll run it 30 years, yeah. About 30 years? Close to it. Have you always been uh, itinerant, always spoke? Or did you right, do, I've never passed You never no, passed no, a church. No, but I've always, yeah. Always. Written books. You know, I started writing back in the early 90s and then speaking in conferences and churches and such. As, oh, okay. Know. Well, I found, I'd heard of, Paul Keith uh, years before, but I really never discovered him. I sort of started listening to him until about four years ago. It was 2014. Many of you who listen to me regularly, you know, 2014, I was a Christian before, I was a preacher before, but 2014, July 2014 was the year, uh, it was the a season where I really said yes to God in a bigger way. And for the last four years, I've been really leaning into mm-hmm. a life of pursuing the presence of God, saying yes to God. And ironically, uh, that was actually the week, the week that I made that decision to say yes to God in a bigger way. There was a few issues in my life that um, other people might not have thought were a big deal, but they were a big deal to God. Mm -hmm. And I knew he was asking for some things, some areas of compromise. And I remember that week, it was actually the same week I heard you preach for the first time. Okay. And uh, I was out for a walk with the Lord and he kind of pinned me to the wall and said, Steve, I've got a destiny for you. Mm. And it's really huge. But if you don't say yes to me right now, I'm going to shrink it. Mm, and, wow. uh, and I remember saying yes to God. I remember this week so clearly. It was really a, a season of my life where I said, okay, God, this is it. From now on, ask me for anything and I'll do it. And, uh, and for the last four years, I don't know if I've done everything he asked me to do, but I've really been leaning into a, a life of pursuing the presence of God, pursuing uh, uh, the, the Spirit, wanting to hear His voice, wanting to see Him. And, uh, and it's interesting that God kind of brought you along right at the beginning of that because your messages, Paul Keith, have really been life to me mm, over yeah. the last four years. And, uh, and I've always looked forward, for those of you... Uh, if you haven't heard them, you want to check out whitedoveministries.org. But uh, I remember way back then I signed up for your email list. Mm-hmm. And uh, since then, uh, a couple times a month, I'll get an email. And I always get excited when that email goes, <laughs> yes, here we go. But those messages have been to me just life because they, they inspire me to believe that there's more. There's a greater realm of glory available to us. There's more for us. We're living in the last days. We should expect God to do greater things. And, uh, and these messages have really inspired me to say yes to God in a bigger way. And so I'm really excited to be able to bring Paul Keith on here and sprinkle him on my, all my redneck friends uh, from uh, Canada. Uh, we do have a few classy people who watch, okay. but we try to keep them to a minimum. Uh, most, of, uh, most of my viewers are uh, pretty raw, and uh, I love them that way. But wanted to introduce them to you. Because God wants you to hear His voice. And I've asked Paul Keith just to share some stories and tell some stories about seeing God. Uh, the Bible says uh, in uh, Mark 9, 1, Jesus said to a group of people, He said, uh, uh, Some of you who are standing here will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God. And, uh, and then in the next verse, verse 2, He says, Six days later, He took Peter, James, and John up onto a mountain And what happened? They saw the kingdom of God. They saw Moses and Elijah walk through the veil. They saw the glory of God. They saw saw Jesus uh, bright as lightning in front of them. They experienced the presence of God. And, uh, And all through the New Testament, you'll see promises where Jesus promises that he will visit us. He wants to be close to us. Uh, The Bible says in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And uh, John 14 is probably my favorite passage where, you know, his disciples are so disappointed that he's leaving. And basically the whole theme of John 14 is, don't worry, guys, I'm going to visit you. Uh, Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will visit you. Uh, The world won't see me anymore, but you will see me. And so anyways, I'm preaching now, and I brought you to preach. But, but I, uh, I, what I love about you, I know you don't like to be put on a pedestal. Uh, it makes you probably squirm a little, but you have seen some stuff. 
and you have seen the kingdom of God. And while I know you're reaching for more, uh, you've had some experiences that, uh, that, uh, that we can learn from and can also inspire us to believe that there is more for us. And so mm-hmm. I want you to tell a couple stories. But before that, I just want to ask you to touch on one thing because mm-hmm. you've mentioned it a few times uh, in some of your own episodes. All right. You've talked about the importance when sharing your revelations, when sharing what God is doing, sharing what God is uh, saying or what you see or if you have an experience. You've talked about the importance of using, just being honest Mm -hmm. about the language that you use. Can you mention that? Can you touch on that? Yeah. You know, um, one of the first things I'd like to say, Steve, is that uh, number one, it's great to be with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> like how I just dive right into preaching. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's great that the people that watch this are hungry to access what I call the unseen realm. We need to understand that we right now live in a natural realm with this table, but just not way up in heaven somewhere, but just right here in a, through a veil is the kingdom of God. Yeah. And it's called the unseen realm of God. Um, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of what is unseen. Mm-hmm. And so we can access the unseen realm through faith. Now, there are different callings and different things that people have in their lives, but I'm of the belief that every born-again, spirit-filled believer can see something. I agree. I believe it. I, I have staked my life on teaching that. The Bible says in uh, Joel 2, and of course quotes it again over in the book of Acts 2, that in the last days God mm-hmm. will pour out His Spirit upon all mankind. That means everybody. Whether you're a stay-at-home mm-hmm. mom or you're an oil-filled worker or a construction man, hand women. or a preacher or an evangelist. Old you, men will see old visions. Men, young young men, men will see You get the dreams, I get the visions. I get both. <laughs> I'm, I'm not there yet, so I'm getting young. Get, I'm getting old men get dreams, young men get visions. <laughs> I want the visions. I, I want both. And so, you know, it says we will be revelatory. The last yep. day generation will be a generation of revelation. And, um, and so that's the fundamental belief that we have to have, that you don't have to be a prophet to see something. You can see something just by virtue of believing the gospel, believing the mm-hmm. word. And I forget now what was the question you originally asked me. <laughs> I want you to talk about <laughs> so, the importance of choosing your our words. language. Our language, our language, very good. So, because we do live in a prophetic generation, you know, and we live in a very unique day where you have all of this media at our disposal. I mean, to be honest with you, anybody can go out with a, a few dollars now and publish a book, or anyone with a computer can put up Facebook Live and YouTube clips and all these things and. And if you do that, you know, you can, you find that people are saying, I went to heaven and I went to the throne room and I saw God and I... I tell t- that story you told, I remember one time about a guy who said he jumped into the Lord's lap. You know, and this, this, is a, this is a good example of that. You know, I, I believe God is holy. <laughs> I know God loves me. I know. But I've had enough experiences. I, I'm not saying I go to heaven every day or anything like that, but I've been enough that I know that when I'm really in the other realm, it is a scary place. <laughs> yeah. I mean, God is holy. Yeah. He is a consuming and fire. And those who come near to me will treat me as will holy. Will treat me as holy. And so this one time, this guy, you know, was saying, oh, I went to, to, I went to the throne room and, and I hopped up in Papa's lap and gave him a high five. Now just think about that for just a minute, you know. And I said, mm, I, I, don't, I don't think so. And he said, why do you say that? And he said, I said, because you're still living. <laughs> you know, I think if you, yeah. you know, that's a holy place. I, you know, I've been to a heavenly place a time or two. Our and, God and is I, a I promise you fire. don't do anything presumptuously. Mm-hmm. There is protocol. Can you imagine just waltzing into the Oval Office of the President of the United States and you're waltzing behind the desk and give the President of the United States a high five? I think Secret Service would have you on the floor, you know. Or just, mm-hmm. just that's just in the human realm. Mm-hmm. Now, does that mean God doesn't? God loves us with a love we'll never comprehend. So it doesn't mean He doesn't love us. It's just that we are still not in a place where we can go into the into that realm and just you know presumptuously do anything. And so you, this guy probably had an experience. He probably where had he experienced a dream. The love of God. He probably had a dream, right. and where he dreamed about a heavenly realm. Well, that's a lot different than what Isaiah experienced. Right. All right. Isaiah didn't have a dream. He went to heaven. Mm-hmm. Paul went to heaven. 
I know a man in Christ, whether 14 years ago or in the body or out, I do mm -hmm. not know, but such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Mm -hmm. So he didn't dream about going to heaven. He was in heaven. Mm -hmm. Isaiah, Isaiah 6, you know, here you see a good example of this where Isaiah is a holy, righteous man. I know it was Old Covenant, but he was taken to the mm -hmm. throne room of God and he said, woe is me. For I, you know, I'm an un I have, I, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And, and the angel didn't say, oh no, Isaiah, you're okay. He walked over with a coal from the altar and put it to Burn. his lips and he, you know, and then he was able to communicate with, with God. And so, so I think Isaiah's response is probably a little bit more what a real visitation yeah. looks like. I had one time um, in Moravian Falls, North Carolina. In, on April the 12th, 2000, I had, um, it was just pursuing God, you know, as we are now. And unexpected, nobody had prophesied it to me. Nobody had said, you're about to have a visitation, nothing like that. But uh, right at daylight that morning, I, um, I went into the spirit. I was actually, um, if I can just put it this way, out of my body. <laughs> you know, the Lord took me out and I'm standing at the foot of the bed and I'm looking at my own body lying on the bed. And you're awake? And I'm, I'm a wide awake. And so, um, and, and when, I, when I did that, the wall behind the headboard, so I'm looking, you know, my body is on the bed, but I'm standing at the foot of the bed and the wall behind the headboard just vanished, just disappeared. And and what was there was a wall of fire. And and I started, you know, right at eye level and started going up. And behind the wall of fire, the wall of fire went up to about the waist uh, of, a, of a being standing there with bronze colored skin, just massive, had on this armor uh, that, that was unlike anything on the earth. And, and, uh, and he was standing there and he had a sword that was drawn and he had the sword held above his head like this. And I mean, I'm, I'm the length of a bed from it. So I'm what, 10 feet? Eight, yeah, eight this feet. This is an angel. It was, well, uh, if I finish. Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, and so I'm looking at this wall of fire and my heart's beginning to pound <laughs> like you can imagine. And I go up and I, and I finally reach his face and he's looking off to the right and I'm right here at the foot of the bed, and he turns his head. And when his eyes met mine, they were literally flames of fire. And I screamed <laughs> like you have never heard a man scream in your life. This is in a hotel I room? Was, this was in a, no, we were, in a, we were guests in someone's home. Oh. They had what they call prophet's quarters downstairs in the basement. Their bedroom was directly above. And this is the real you screaming, not the one looking at so, you. So yeah, the one that was screaming was the me in bed. <laughs> Ah. And, and I mean, I was just undone. He was captain of the host. I was seeing Joshua 5.13. He wow. said, I'm here, you know, as captain of the Lord's hosts. And I made eye contact. And the moment my eyes met his eyes, I was undone. You didn't jump in his lap and give him a high five? I was glad <laughs> I survived. Now, man, I'm being very honest. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm telling you, I was not the same person. I was undone. It was terrifying and exhilarating at the same time. Now, how can you have both emotions at the same time? Only in the realm of the Spirit. Now, that happened. That is real. That happened. I will go to my grave testifying to that event. It was there. And so, you know, I didn't even think about approaching him and giving him a high five. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you were standing on your side. I'm like, I hope you don't cut my head off with that sword. You know, <laughs> what I'm thinking. Um, but, but no, I was, I was just undone. I was, and, and it's kind of like Joshua. Joshua says to this angel, or the angel of the Lord, which is we know is the Lord, uh, who, who are you with? Are you for us or you for them? He was nervous. And know? he said, well, I'm neither. I'm here as captain of the host. You better get on my side. And so mm -hmm. I was just, you know, and of course there was a whole message that came with that, that we are shifting into the Joshua generation that we're no longer under the leadership of Moses. And I have this whole message that I did where the prior generation from 1948 until the present hour has been more of a Moses type generation, bringing the people out, but not yet taking the people in. Mm -hmm. The whole latter rain voice of healing revival was a bringing out of the people from cold formal religion mm -hmm. 
organized Christianity. We're still in that process. People are still being Mm -hmm. pulled out of those organizational Mm -hmm. structures. And we've been in the wilderness. We feel like we've been in the wilderness, you know. Um, We've had some encounters. You know, we've had some good things happening here, but we all know we're not there yet. No. We all know we got across the Jordan. And I do believe that we have come full circle right now as we speak and about to cross back over, but we're going to do so. What was interesting was at, at that time, you know, I had been asking the Lord, you know, you said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. This mm-hmm. was kind of a question I had before the Lord. And I said to, to the Lord, well, Lord, if, if you were with Moses as you were, as you, if you were with Joshua as you were with Moses, where was his burning bush experience? And then that's when I had the experience of seeing the captain of the host. And he said, that was it. So if you go to Joshua 5.13, you see that he had a burning bush experience. But he's already done the Moses thing. Mm -hmm. That was the very same God that met Moses in the burning bush. And Moses was to go take the bring, bring the people out and he was to write the law. But now that same spirit came back, but he's no longer appearing to Joshua as he did to Moses. He said, I come now as captain of the host. I'm coming now as a warrior. I'm coming mm-hmm. now because we're about to cut heads. Mm-hmm. You know, and you need to get on my side because mm-hmm. I'm about to do some... You know, so, that was, <laughs> so Moses and Joshua, Joshua actually had a burning bush experience, but it was him as the captain of the host. Wow. That was my whole message that came from that. Well, that's been 18 years ago. How much closer are we now, you mm-hmm. know, to, to that reality that we're about to see the Lord really release some serious warlike authority on the earth? And we're, 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 that's the things we've been prophesying, the bride of Christ. And that would be what you would refer to as a visitation. That was a visitation. Because I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, I had a visitation last night and God said this and that. Or, and it's such a kind of almost lightly, like it's a little mm-hmm. thing to have a visitation. And so, yeah, no, I distinguish it. I'm, I'm careful with my words because I dream every night. I mean, I sometimes I will lay in bed and before I'm asleep, I'm dreaming. I know that sounds weird, but it's true. I can mm-hmm. be lying there and I'm, you know, just about to go to sleep and I start dreaming. And sometimes I even come to myself without even being asleep yet. And I've already got a dream I'm right now. So I'm, but not all of them are from God. Mm-hmm. You know, probably during the course of a night, I might dream 12, 15 dreams, and I'll remember them all. And you remember them all. Oh, yeah, during the night or in the morning. And then most of them, I realize it's just me processing the day, my soul processing what I've been through or whatever. But when, there's, when it's a God dream, it has a different atmosphere, mm-hmm. has a different um, realm to it, mm-hmm. a, a clarity, a seriousness, a... Like, pay attention, this is me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sometimes, not always, sometimes I will hear the Lord say, this is a vision or this is, a, this is me. Pay attention to every detail. Mm-hmm. I'll sometimes hear that. Watch every detail. And so I'm just careful to see every little detail I can. Hmm. And as soon as I come out of it, I write it down or do whatever. Oh, you hear that in your dream. Oh, in the dream, I'll hear a voice. I, not always. Pay attention. This is me. You know, so I like that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, now, it doesn't, it doesn't happen every time. It doesn't happen every time, but sometimes it does. Um, and, and so, uh, you know. And, you well, know. I appreciate that you will use the word dream when you're talking about dreams. I appreciate when you're, watch, when you're talking, you say, I had an impression. It actually is because you'll say, I had an impression, or because I was feeling this. Or sometimes you'll say, I'm not sure if it's the Lord, but I sense this. Because you're so careful, and you don't always say, I had a dream, I had a visitation. I, then once in a while, on those rare occasion, occasions, when you actually say, the Lord walked in the room, or mm-hmm. I, uh, I saw this, I believe you saw it. It was there. Well, here's the distinction. <clears throat> if you'll remember, Gabriel makes appearances in the early part of the New Testament. And to Joseph, the husband of uh, betrothed of Mary, the Bible says Gabriel appeared to Joseph in a dream. In a dream. If it was, yeah, if dreams are good enough. And, and, the, and the revelation was true. It was real, but it was in a dream. But when he visited with Mary, she wasn't in a dream. She was up. wide awake. She was in the middle of the day. And, and something of a tangible, spiritual substance was standing next to her and said, Woman, be of good cheer, you know, and so on, and prophesied to her about the birth of the Messiah. Yeah. So there you have, you know, in a dream, the angel appeared. 
in another place the angel appeared. Well, I think it's important for us to make that distinction too. Mm-hmm. Most now, here's something that's really dangerous and we've kind of getting off into a, but you have to be really careful of the imagination because there's a teaching mm-hmm. out there where people say, okay, you know, I'm going to bring an anointing into the room. Maybe you've got 300 people. I've been in the meeting when this has happened. I've personally been in the meeting. you got 300 people in a room and somebody's leading the room and he says, now we're going to all go to heaven. Well, number one, we my, all just going to decide to go. That's the whole point. I don't believe we have that authority. All right. So they say, now close your eyes and what do you see in your head? Well, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> you know, people's got in that. So their imaginations and they say, okay, what did you see? Well, I, I went to heaven and I saw the father sitting on the throne and he did this. Well, that's not a visitation. You know, right. um, and I actually confronted a leader one time for doing that. I, I said, and this was a man I loved. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, we were in this meeting last night. We had breakfast. It had gone on the night before. So the next morning, just he and I at breakfast. And I said, so and so, you know, I, I struggle a little bit with that because, you know, you said, you know, everybody just close your eyes and what you imagine in your head is a revelation from God. And he said, that's right. It's the sanctified imagination. And I said, okay, okay. And I said, how many people have you ever met that have a sanctified imagination? And he thought a minute, this is an elderly man. He said, none. He said, and I said, well, then that means that the revelations may not, if someone is so pure mm-hmm. in their heart and in their thoughts that their imagination is completely pure, then maybe what you're seeing in your imagination. Now, does God use our imagination? There sure. are some places that our imagination are useful. But if I just imagined in my head what the Father looks like sitting on His throne, that doesn't mean that's what it looks like. Uh, when John went to the throne in Revelation 4, my, my belief is everybody that goes there, the way John did, will see exactly what he saw. I got a question for you. Okay. Uh, I was, you know, I've had a few experiences. I've had uh, one thing that I would <clears> call a, a vision. I've had, I've had a few significant experiences, but not as many as I like. And uh, in my pursuit of more revelatory experiences and mm-hmm. presence, uh, yeah, I mean, you're looking for keys. You're looking for access. How do you get in? How do you mm-hmm. unlock the right. kingdom of God? Someone mentioned to me, and I, and I don't know if it's not true or if it is true, so I'm, I'm going to throw this one at you. But someone said that when you've had an experience in the past, maybe you've had a, you saw the captain of the guard. Mm-hmm. If you will imagine that moment, if you can go back in your mind and imagine that real encounter, by imagining it, you can, it sometimes becomes like a portal that will open a door into other things. What do you think of that? I think that is possible. Um, I don't think as many people are doing that as they say they are. Do I believe we can revisit visit visions? Yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying. I do believe we can. Okay. I do, but, I, but here's the thing. I don't trust myself. I want uh, God to take me. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. I want the Lord by His Spirit. As many as are led by the yeah. Spirit, they are the sons of God. Um, sometimes I will think on a revelation. I say, Lord, okay, you took me here. And I will. I will say, okay, take me. let me see that beyond. Let me visit that again. Let me see more. I do that, sure. Do I always get an answer? No, because I won't. I'm, I've been in this long enough to know there's no need in prophesying something that doesn't come from God because if it doesn't happen, it only makes you look bad. Mm-hmm. You know, you might stand up and give the, mo- the mo- most... Let me give you an example. I was in a meeting in, in 1999 and some of the biggest names in prophetic ministry were in a meeting that I was in. I was sitting no more than a few feet and they were saying, Why two, I have a word from the Lord. Why 2K is going to demolish banking, it's going to destroy utility systems, the world as we know it will no longer exist. I heard it with my own ears. I'm sitting feet from the people that said this. Okay. These are big name prophets. Big name prophetic voices that most everyone would recognize if I said it. I'm in the room. I'm in the room. I didn't hear this by you know, hearsay. I'm there mm-hmm. in the room. And of course, we all know that Y2K was nothing. It wasn't a hiccup. And that's what I said. I prophesied it would be nothing in the same meeting. You said it in the same In the meeting. meeting. I said, I believe January 1st will be no different than December 31st. That's what I said. The Lord is my witness. And <laughs> they didn't like that? <laughs> no, they got mad at me. 
got mad at me. And, and the leader of the meeting, I'll, I'll just, since we're doing Revelation, I'll share this little story. So went around the room and some of these major voices, Y2K is going to destroy life as we know. That was the bottom line. And I, and I said, I don't believe that it's going to be anything. I think it'll be nothing. It's just one day will lead right into another one like every other day. And the moderator of the meeting finally said, I had a vision. And he said, um, he said, I was at the helm of a ship and um, as the admiral of the ship. And this guy had been in the Navy, in the natural, he had been in the Navy but was retired. And he said, I was at the helm of the ship and I looked on the radar and there was a blip right in front of us. And he said the, the blip was, you know, on a collision course. So he said, you know, 45 degrees port. So they turned the ship 45 degrees port and the blip is still right in front of them but closer. So they're on collision course. He says, okay, 15 degrees starboard. Now, starboard this way, port's this way. <laughs> 45 degrees port, still there. 15 degrees starboard, still there, but closer. So he finally goes over the loudspeaker, brace for impact. So you got this huge blip right in front of the ship, and everybody is braced for impact, and they just go right through it. Nothing. Happened. Nothing. And he said, Lord, what was that? He said, Y2K. It's unavoidable, but it's nothing. It's unavoidable and it's nothing. Right. So but he said that in the meeting. So now, why do I say all that? Because for me, you know, some of these prophetic voices lost credibility. Did they anybody was, address that or say, hey, what about... Well, not, not the way it should have been, in my opinion. Now, that goes way back to the year 2000. Um, hmm. But my deal was, you know, why... Why are we anxious to prophesy something if it, and if it doesn't happen? Because we're watering down our currency. We're crying wolf. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then wow. finally when we really wow. do see something Nobody and we cry wolf, nobody's going to listen. Well, well, you're the one that prophesied Y2K. Why should <laughs> I listen to that? Well, you know. So my deal is I don't want to. I have no desire to prophesy anything that I don't really completely believe came from God. Yeah because it's going to make me look foolish. Mm -hmm. But I also want to have the courage, though, on the other side of that, if I see something and I believe it, to stand up and say, this is what I saw. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and mm -hmm. I, will, I will try to use language mm -hmm. that regulate the level of my revelation. Mm -hmm. You've heard me do that. Mm -hmm. I'll say, you know, I, I, just, I had this in a dream. I, you know, this, I was asleep and this came in my dream and this is what I saw. I submit it to you. And let you decide, discern mm -hmm. it for yourself. Maybe, you know, God's got something mm -hmm. in it to say. Whatever. I, so I don't say, I had a visitation from the Holy Spirit. Well, if you have, here, here's my deal. Here's my deal. And I actually was in a meeting. I was, well, you know, we could go into war stories. But if somebody says the Lord Jesus Christ is standing right there and says thus and so, it better happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Otherwise, Otherwise we're just playing house. You're making him out to be a liar. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. Mm -hmm. So if a man, and I had that happen. A man said to me, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is sitting on the Mount of Olives, this meeting one. The Son of God says to tell you this, and it didn't happen. Well, I mean, you know, one of two things. You know, either... God didn't miss it. God, right. <laughs> If the Lord Jesus Christ is manifest, and I've had people say, you know, that Jesus came into my room and said thus and so, and then it didn't happen. Well, yeah. that, that so is, we, we need to safety. address the, that. You know, the reality is there's safety in honesty. There's safety in integrity. There's nothing wrong, and this is so important, especially when you're hungry for revelatory realms and you're hungering for the kingdom. There's nothing wrong with saying, I had an impression. Often, that's great. Impressions are wonderful. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing wrong with saying I had a dream. Uh, dreams are not uh, a little thing. You know, God led, uh, like you say, Joseph with dreams. You know, but if you have an impression, don't call it a visitation. If you have a, a feeling, don't call it a, a throne room experience. Just I call agree. it what is. And then I when agree. you do have a more of a, a, a whatever, uh, maybe a real genuine impression or, or a real genuine visitation, and maybe that'll happen a couple times in your life, people will actually believe you because right. it's not something that you say every day. And even then, so sometimes people won't believe you. I remember my mom told me a story when I was young, and she had no stories like this, but she remember she told me when I was young, she said that she had a visitation 
uh, from Jesus and my dad. Well, my dad had committed suicide mm. when I was nine months old. And about a year later, my, uh, my mom was standing in the kitchen, or no, she was downstairs. She was downstairs doing laundry. And she was worrying about whether he was in heaven or hell. Mm. Someone had said to her, you know, sometimes, you know, if you commit suicide, you go to hell. Mm. And so she was doing laundry and worrying about the eternal destination of her husband. And she said, uh, and she told me the story many times. I never believed her all through my childhood. She told me the story many times. She said, I was doing laundry, worrying about him, dad. And all of a sudden on the other side of the basement, Jesus Christ appeared. Mm. And with him, my dad. Wow. And she said, they walked across the basement. Jesus said nothing. She, she said, he just smiled at me. He said, Bernie, my dad, looked me straight in the eye. She looked me straight in the eye and she said, he said, I'm fine. They turned around, walked across the basement, and vanished into thin air. <laughs> wow. I, I never believed her. My whole uh, life, I remember my whole child, my mom passed away when I was 19 years old. But I remember I said to her many times, I said, Mom, do you, maybe you just had the impression that you saw them. And she's like, <laughs> they were there. And she, I said, she stuck by it. Huh? I said, maybe you uh, just sensed their presence. Maybe you saw them with your, I used to say this, do you think maybe you saw them with your spiritual eyes? <laughs> you know, this is my way of trying to talk her out. And she said, Steve, if you were there, you would have seen them. They were in the room. And she said, I don't care. You don't have to believe me. She said, they were there. You know, yeah. but she had no other stories like it. And you know, it was years after she died. Uh, this was actually in the last four years. It was about three years ago. I was praying and I was seeking the Lord. I was crying out to God. And I was saying, Lord, visit me. Come and visit me. I want to see you. And I remember the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Steve, I would reveal myself to you more. But you don't even believe in this stuff. Mm. You didn't even believe your own mother. Mm, wow. Oh, wow. I wept uh. when he said that. I was like, <laughs> and I remember at first I just, I'm like, oh, it's true. And then in the mm. next moment, I'm like, wait a minute. My mom saw Jesus. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. My mom saw Jesus. But it is yeah. possible to have <clears throat> visitations. We can have anything that's in the Bible. Absolutely. I believe that. What, whatever... They even in the Old Testament. I mean, the script. This is all scriptures inspired by God, good for mm -hmm. us for teaching, reproof, correction, all these different things. So my personal belief is, well, actually, my my stance with the Lord is, okay, Lord, you took Paul to heaven. I'm not Paul, but he he was nothing either. Mm -hmm. You took John on the island of Patmos, and and so you set a precedent. Mm -hmm. that humanity, mankind, living on the earth can access mm -hmm. that realm. Okay, Lord, if you didn't want me to have it, then you shouldn't have put it in the book. <laughs> because you knew, the Lord knew, the moment I read that with spiritual I'm eyes, gonna I'm going to want it. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these things I've been on a quest for 30 years to experience and haven't yet. Do I believe I will before it's over? Yes. I do. What do you think about the great cloud of witnesses? My well, mom says that my dad walked up to her. You know, we are surrounded. Now, here's my teaching on that, and I'll try to do a very abbreviated thing because I have a whole series on it. But, okay, the Bible says, and, and of course, you know, Hebrews 11 and 12 deal with the cloud of witnesses. But Hebrews 12, we're surrounded. We're encompassed about, it says in another translation, by this great cloud of testifiers. That's what the word That's witnesses is, testifiers, if you look up the meaning of the word, witnesses. We're surrounded. Even right now, Steve, as you and I are sitting here, um, we're surrounded by an unseen realm. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. Take, for instance, Gehazi, who was the servant of Elisha. Mm. Remember him? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he walks out, and <laughs> he and Elisha are surrounded by the Assyrian army. Mm -hmm. And Gehazi goes into this fear mode, right? And, and he says, you know, <laughs> Elijah, why aren't you panicking like I am? You know, we're surrounded. And Elijah says, are you kidding? There's more for us than there are for them. <laughs> and Gehazi looks around, one, two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Remember? Okay, all right. So Elisha prays, Lord, open his eyes. Yeah. Okay. Nothing happened any different. The only thing that happened was the veil was pulled back and Gehazi saw what was already there. Right. They were surrounded. Yeah. They were already there. They didn't all of a sudden come real quick so Gehazi could see them. They were already there. All that happened was he had an ability for the curtain to be pulled back, and he saw who was for them. Mm -hmm. Now, we're surrounded. 
by a great for, cloud of for witnesses. For those who don't know that passage, uh, it's Second Kings 6, but when he opened his eyes, he saw the hills were filled with horses and chariots of fire right. all around them. And all then around he was them. like, oh, okay, there is more with us than there is with and them. And they were always there. Yeah, they were they there were already the whole there. time. All right, now, take that, translate it over to Hebrews 12. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And all of a sudden, if God says, okay, I'm going to open your eyes and you're going to see what's already there, what are you going to see? The great cloud of witness. Absolutely. That's totally so biblical. So people who say, and they say uh, well, this is necro necromancy, uh, speaking to the dead. They're more alive than we are. <laughs> they <laughs> they are, are more alive than we are. Mm -hmm. That is totally unbiblical. Necromancy, number one, is the act of conjuring up spirits. Right. And we see that over, you know, when Saul conjured up the spirit of Samuel. Let me go ahead, tiny rabbit trail, just because you brought up 2 Kings 6. Uh, he opens his eyes and he sees the hills filled with horses and chariots of fire, mm -hmm. it says, all around Elisha. Uh, here's something I'm putting you on the spot, but this is something I've always uh, wondered about. Uh, the only other place in Scripture where you'll find a chariot of fire Elijah. is Elijah. <laughs> and so when I read that and I see him open his eyes and he sees the horses and chariots of fire, I wonder, you just tell me what you think and tell me if I'm totally wrong, but I wonder if Elisha looks up and says, ha ha. My spiritual father came back and he brought all the heaven with him. Oh, well, I mean, that's not unreasonable. I mean, who knows? Who knows? I mean, that's a very clear possibility um, mm -hmm. because the same spirit that was on Elijah was on Elisha. Yeah. Um, so we don't know what's right here in this little bitty room. We're in our old studio here. We don't yeah. know what's in this room unless the Lord opens our eyes. But if he does open them, maybe we'll mm. see some angels standing around. Maybe a couple of the cloud of witnesses that decide to come in and check us out. Maybe your dad's watching us right now. Maybe some of my family has come. Maybe some of the people. My, I'm of the belief if you talk about certain people, they come. Or if you talk about certain things, they come. Hmm. I had that happen. I did a series on uh, some of the great spiritual fathers. And multiple times when I was talking about like A.E. Allen, I had multiple witnesses said they had their eyes open and they saw the cloud of witnesses and some of the very people in the meeting that I was honoring. Wow. I was honoring A.E. You know, Allen. I was honoring mm -hmm. Alexander Dowry. I was honoring John G. Lake. I was honoring William Branham and Catherine Kuhlman, and they, they came. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in that principle. I do. I believe in the, you know, what you talk, you talk about demons and they're going to come. <laughs> you talk about angels, they're going to come. That, you know, the, anyway. Well, well take, let me take you back a little bit. Uh, mo many of us have, uh, many people watching have never seen an angel, n never mm -hmm. mind, you know, anything like what you, you happened in your bed that day. Let's go back to the beginning, to kind of where you started. You mentioned in the last episode when you were filled with the Holy Spirit, you immediately began to have uh, experiences uh, to go there. Just where did you okay. start and how did it escalate? What did it look <clears throat> like? And even even if you would even just kind of give us a, a real picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because one thing I often teach on Oil Patch Pulpit is that there's a lot of people who think they're filled and they're not full. They are. And, That's uh, true. And, and they think they're baptized with fire and they aren't an inch deep. And so mm -hmm. when you, uh, one, I believe that when, as Jesus said, you will receive power, not just the ability to say shun right. but you'll receive power mm -hmm. when the Holy Spirit comes on you. But when you had your baptism, what you referred to mm -hmm. as your baptism in the Holy Spirit in 1989, stuff began to happen. All right. Well, I think the first thing I'd like to say of that is that there has been a false teaching. I believe a false teaching that if you speak in tongues, you're filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. I don't think just speaking in tongues is evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Although I do believe if you're filled with the Spirit, you do speak in tongues. Right. But demons can speak in tongues. Hmm. If you don't love, you're not filled with the Spirit. If you, if you deny the Word of God, you're not filled with the Spirit. Because you, if you're filled with the Spirit, your Spirit is going to say yes and amen to everything that's in the Word. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a litmus test right now of a person that's really filled with the Spirit. They might speak in tongues all day long, but, but if, they're, if, if they're, they're a disaster a in the life of every person they come in contact with, there's a problem with their experience. Mm -hmm. If you say that you speak in tongues but deny healing, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, because the very author of the book is supposed to be filling you, and you can't deny healing it so clearly, or even if you deny any aspect of the word. So for me, you asked me about my experience. My, my first thing, well, my first experience with God came at the age of 12. I was, um, I didn't even know to call it an experience. I didn't even know what it was for years. I didn't even know what it was until I became 
well, really, after I began to be filled with the Holy Spirit and began to search out what was going on in my life, then I realized what happened to me all those years ago at the age of 12 was a God experience. But at the age of 12... How old I'll, were you when you got saved? Um, I had a born-again experience in 1975. I was 18. Okay, so um, 12 to 18. So, so at the age of 12, here's what happened with me. Um, I'm, our fam we had gone through some great hardships in my family. Um, my brother, younger brother, who's now in heaven, had some serious health issues in and out of the hospital all the time. My dad was not, say, very rough guy. You know, he's, everybody loved him, and he's in heaven now, praise the Lord. And I want to dishonor him in any way, but just to be honest about my, my experience, you know, he was pretty rough. He was mm -hmm. rough on me and rough on my mom. And so <clears throat> uh, we were just about to enter a really, really hard season of my life and our whole family's life. But I'm standing at a window, but I didn't know that time. I'm standing at a window and I'm looking out this window. I can still see it when I tell it. I can still see the images of it in my head. I'm looking out and there's a tree right outside my window, 12 year old, and right above the tree, I mean just a couple of feet above the tree, it seems like, there's a cloud. And I thought, I've never seen a cloud that low. Even as a 12 year old mm -hmm. boy, I'm thinking, why is a cloud that low? You know, they've always been way up in the sky, you know. Mm -hmm. Just a small, white, cumulus cloud right above this tree. And I'm looking at it just pondering how in the world could a cloud be that low? And all of a sudden, the cloud started talking to me. <laughs> really? Not audibly. I, I mean, well, to me it was audible, but I mean, I heard a voice begin to talk to me. I don't remember ever hearing the story. Yeah, and I said, who are you? He said, I'm God. Just like that. He didn't say, I'm the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I'm God. And the moment he said to me, I'm God, love for God got deposited in my heart. And, and it set boundaries. This is the best way I can put it. I didn't understand the, the phrase born again. I, I, you know, I didn't understand because we rarely went to church. And so I didn't, I didn't get that. I didn't understand having a, a, you know, a salvation experience or any of those things. I just knew that I loved God. I loved him so much, it was so funny as a little boy, I used to think the Bible was God, you know, so I wouldn't even let my Bible touch the floor. I mean, really? you know, oh yeah, I was just, it was just these little weird little things I used to do. But I loved God. I loved God. And I got into my teenage years and it was really rough. I don't mean to make myself sound bad. I know a lot of people have difficulties, but this is the 1970s, you know, and I could have gotten off into drugs and who knows whatever. And that love put boundaries on my life. Hmm. Even you though I didn't couldn't go here. I couldn't go beyond a certain boundary. Hmm. I never did drugs. Hmm. If I had ever discovered drugs, the condition I was in and the anger I had, I wouldn't be here right now. Hmm. Uh, you know, and so I had these boundaries, parameters. I didn't drink a little beer, you know, but not a lot. I, did, I was an athlete and went to college on an athletic scholarship and so you know, but I just didn't get into rebellion. I, did, I was pretty angry. That's why I was good in football. I was angry all the time. <laughs> but anyway, I went to college and the guy, you know, asked me if I'd been born again. I'm like, born again? But here's something interesting. Um, when I had that, I loved God, okay? Mm -hmm. Had this experience at 12. And I, this might help some people. And so I'm thinking, okay, I love God. I need to go to church, which is true. I'm not saying that's not a true statement. So we went to the local church, you know, sometimes, not often, but sometimes. And I have to be honest, I would sit in that pew and I would like beat me with a hickory stick, but I can't take this. It was so boring. It was so awful. I mean, it was like, will this hour please end? <laughs> I called it the eternal hour. I get hour. invited to preach in some of those churches. <laughs> well, I'm, and I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to sound critical. I'm just telling you my experience mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. I'm thinking, okay, I love God, so therefore I should love this church. Something's wrong with me. Right. This should be enjoyable. This, I should be embracing it because I love God. And so something's wrong with me because I can't tolerate this three hymns, announcements, a three-point sermon, uh, you know, a salvation altar call to the people that are already saved and the same three people coming up for prayer every single Sunday 
and it's you know ending at twelve, and we and the thirty minute offering. <laughs> and, oh, they didn't have those. No, they didn't. They, it was just we were there from eleven to twelve. Twelve o'clock, it was over. Oh, it was one hour. It was over and one was, hour. Even to that was long. You could put your roast on the timer. Oh, I'm not kidding. You know, and so, <laughs> and I could, and I, I struggled. I'm being very serious. I struggled with the fact that I couldn't embrace that because mm. I knew I loved God. So I thought I'm something's wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, as I got older and I got filled with the Spirit, I realized God's not into religion. No, He's not. He's into relationship. And so I went there looking for relationship, and I found religion, and it was butting heads with what was on the inside of me. Mm -hmm. But I thought for a long time I was defective. Mm -hmm. Something was wrong with me because I couldn't embrace church. Mm -hmm. Now, do I believe in the local church? I do. Mm -hmm. I believe in having a fellowship of people. I believe in going, Mm -hmm. but I also believe in the gospel, you know, Mm -hmm. the spirit-filled gospel. And where I had been in services that goes four hours and you just wish it wouldn't end because mm-hmm. God's there, you mm-hmm. know? And so that I'm longing for that where every service is that way. And so, you know, that was my experience. And in 1989, I, those churches are rare. They are rare. There is a but, lot of dry places out there. And there I'm, are. And I want people to know, I want some of your followers to know that, you know, you might love God, but you're struggling with some of the local church stuff. And I'm not Don't being give critical. Up. Don't give up. <laughs> Don't right? give up. Don't give up. I do believe in plugging in as best you can yeah. with wherever you can. Nobody, you might say, well, I don't have a church that believes everything I believe. Welcome to the club. <laughs> you know. I was out in the old patch one day, stuck in the mud and wrecked the front end of my truck in this big tank truck drive drove by. And uh, the guy's like, you need to tow him. Like, yeah. He <laughs> comes and he pulls me out of the mud. And uh, as he's walking back to his truck, he looks back at me and says, you're that oil patch preacher, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yeah, you watch oil patch pulpit? He's like, yep, almost every episode. Oh, that's and great. I said, really? Well, that's great. God bless you, brother. I said, do you go to church? What church do you go to? And he said, I don't go to church. And I could see in his eyes there was there was some pain there. I don't go to church. But he said, I like your show. And, you know, I, I realized, and, and I don't... I don't hope that that's the case for a lot of people, but I know that's the case for a lot of people, mm-hmm. that they haven't a plain... They, they're hungry for the Lord, but like yourself... They haven't found a place yet where they come alive spiritually. Right, right. And, you know, my my deal is there, hold on. Yeah, hang because on. Some, and there are wonderful coming. places. Yeah, there are. And, and things are about to change in the church. Amen. I believe that. Amen. And to kind of move quickly now, you know, I, I was filled with the Holy Spirit in 1989. And um, I began at night, during the night seasons, I began to be taken and I, I didn't even know how to didn't have the language. Would almost, this be a dream? Or well, I don't be? know what you'd call it. I mean, I'm asleep, but it's like I'm taken and I saw things and, and, and like I'd have these dreams where I was like, I believed that I was standing in heaven seeing angels walk around. You know, now whether I was literally there or whether... This you is know, after you were born after again? After I was filled with the Holy after Spirit. After filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. I would have these things that I didn't even have a word to describe, but it was like I would be taken I, and shown things, and and I didn't know what they were. There wasn't anybody. I was living alone at the time. There wasn't anybody in a 400-mile radius of where I lived that even understood what was going on with me, much less preached it. To back up to being filled with the Holy Spirit then. Okay. Did that happen when you were 18? No, it did not. So when were you filled with the Holy Spirit? 1989. Which I is was, how many? I was old? 32 years. I was 32 okay, so years old. The first 15 years in the Lord or whatever, you're not having experiences. I'm not. You love God, you go to church sometimes, right. but you're not having these experiences. Right. How did you get filled with the Holy Spirit? What I got is so like? desperate. Um, well, first of all, 1979, the, the, you know, this is a, I didn't want to make this story too long. You know what? If we have to chop this into two episodes, we okay. will. I can okay. do that. I can slice right. it. Go 75, for it. a guy led me to the Lord. Hey friends, sorry to cut you off right in the middle of an amazing message. It's not done, don't worry. Uh, We're a little over halfway through, but he's about to tell some of the craziest stories you've ever heard. They're going to have the hair on the back of your neck standing on end. But I just wanted to chop this in half uh, just to keep uh, from, from going too long. If you want to watch the second half, don't worry, it doesn't cost anything. Just go to my website. I think it's episode 33. will be part two of this message titled accessing unseen realms with paul keith davis so you just watched part one go watch part two just go to my website oilpatchpulpit.com 
and click into the episodes. By the way, the pup joints are my short messages, five, 10 minute ones. Episodes are these longer ones. And uh, it should be about episode 33, I think. So anyways, go watch part two. You're gonna love it. You do not want to miss the end of this message. I promise you the best is yet to come. I'll see you over there, oilpatchpulpit.com.